We are in the book of Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, third gospel in the New Testament, uh, chapter one. We've been studying the biblical character, the old priest named Zacharias. And some have asked uh, the difference in the translations uh, because uh, one translation calls him Zacharias, the other one calls him Zechariah. Uh, and the difference being uh, Zechariah is the Hebrew name and Zacharias is the Greek name. Same name, not a different man. Not a discrepancy that uh, anyone could point out that dissolves the power of the Word of God. So if that was a question that you had that you posed, uh, there's your answer. So it's lunchtime. It's ready to go. So that's it. <laughs> uh, we're studying uh, the third time uh, the, the life of Zacharias. And he has much to teach us about uh, having hearts full of praise at the Christmas season because uh, God used him greatly as being the father of uh, the Messiah, the, uh, the, of the Messianic forerunner, John the Baptist. That was going to be his son. And uh, we have much to learn. So we have uh, many verses to cover today. I want to start the, by introducing you to a friend of mine. Uh, his name's Gary. And his name is G-E-R-R-Y, uh, spelled that way, G- uh, Gary Moore. Uh, uh, and I've known him for, I don't know, probably 25, 30 years. Uh, he uh, worked for Fritz Gruppi, a developer in California, a very successful man. Uh, he developed projects for him. And one of the projects that he developed back in the 90s uh, was a housing area near our, our first home uh, in Stockton, where I was pastoring, uh, uh, an area of, of like elite homes. And uh, they wanted these homes uh, to be built around lakes. And so uh, Gary first had to uh, take land that had no lakes and to build lakes. And so he spent many months preparing the land with big DC-9 caterpillars, moving dirt around, building these huge lakes. And then Stockton is surrounded by 2,000 miles of waterway that comes in from... Uh, uh, San Francisco from the Bay. It's the most in, inland port in the United States from what they say on their verbiage about the city. Uh, and so there's plenty of water to tap into. And they had a massive pipe uh, that went about uh, 30 feet straight down into the ground. Uh, and in this uh, vertical pipe was a gate valve that was going to flood the lakes when they built these beautiful homes. Uh, and so there came the day uh, to flood the lakes. And I would constantly go out there as the pastor. And it was a smaller church, so I had time to show up at work sites of parishioners. Can't really do that anymore. Uh, I wouldn't get, I wouldn't never be here. So, uh, but a smaller church back at the time. So I could kind of hang out with people and he was one of my elders at the church. And so we spent a lot of time together and I went out there one day, the day of the, you know, letting the water out and there was a massive wheel in the bed of his Silverado pickup truck. Uh, and I'm like, Hey, what's, you know, what's up with that? He goes, well, that's, that's the wheel, you know, to open the gate valve to flood the lakes. I'm like, wow, that's amazing. And they took that giant wheel and they put it on the pin of, uh, of the gate valve and they opened that. Uh, and it was a day of great celebration from the workers. Uh, and they opened it all the way. Nothing. It's California. Yeah, no, nothing. You know, just the, the tube filled up with water and then it just kind of spilled over the edge. That's it. And they're looking at that going, what in the world? So uh, they, you know, closed the gate valve again, reopened it, thinking this is going to do the trick. Nothing. Nothing. Just dribbled out. And they're looking at these massive lakes thinking this is not, this is going to take centuries. You know, it's not going to work. And so they problem solved and they realized the only thing they could do was to send a diver down there. Did you hear me? <laughs> it's 30 feet straight down a dark tube. You know, people come on my office, they're like, I have a hard time knowing the will of God. What is the will of God? Sometimes God's will is totally clear, isn't it? Would God want you to go head first down a dark tube of water? I mean, I, I'm telling them, I would never volunteer for that. Count me out. Uh, so they hired a scuba diver, some crazy California kid, put on a scuba suit. I'm going down, and they, they tied a rope to his ankle. I don't want to lose him. Well, we got him back, you know. <laughs> Woo. That's why I, I, I'm not going down. Um, so they sent him down that tube, head first, to find the obstruction. How many would say, I would volunteer? We have people here that would do it. You might even free dive it. Half our people, yes. I'll do the funeral for free, too. So, I mean, it's just saying. But... Uh, so they sent him down. He found out what the issue was, what the obstruction was, and fixed that. And next thing you know, whew, water just shot out of that old pipe and began to fill those lakes. And now today, there's beautiful homes uh, that Gary built around those lakes, and it's a gorgeous place uh, to live. But there was an obstruction that kept the water from shooting out. That is a beautiful metaphor, is it not? When you look at Zacharias, Zacharias, the old priest that went into the holy uh, temple and he went into the holy place, to, it was his only opportunity of his whole life to offer prayers for Israel. He goes in with his uh, two attendants, one with the censer of fire, one with the altar that has the, has the incense, and he, they're going to give him both of those things, and they're going to leave him in there to pray. 
He only gets to do this once in his life, and he's, he's probably around 70. This is it for him, pinnacle of his career. And while he's in there in the quiet, in the flickering light of the menorah candle, uh, he has kind of a visitation. Uh, quite not what he expected, because who showed up? You, uh, how many have been in church the last couple of weeks? Excellent. Who, who was in the room with him? Gabriel. Who's that? Not just an angel. Remember I said there's high angels and flunkier lower class ones? This is like a main one. This is Israel's angel. He shows up to him and tells him, great news. I got good news for you. This is a review if you haven't been here. He has great news. Great news is you might be old and so is your wife, but you're going to have a child. And that child is going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. And you're, oh, you're going to name him John. Don't even have to think about the name. No arguments in this family. God named the child. How do you take the news? Scale of one to 10, 10 being total belief. Hallelujah. Yes. Praise God. And ain't no way that's happening. He's, a, he's down there, isn't he? Yeah. He, he, I don't even, not even a three. It's debatable. I'm thinking like one, maybe a negative two. No, no, no faith at all. He's like, this ain't happening. Uh, my wife and I, can't, we can't do this anymore. That's, we can't have children. And so how did the angel respond? Did he look at him and go, God is so understanding, so gracious, so long-suffering, so kind, so merciful. Is that what Gabriel did? No. He immediately struck him with what? Do you remember the sermon from two weeks ago? Yeah. Yeah, he can't speak. And we know from the, from the text that, because they're writing him notes on tablets, he can't hear either. For nine months. The greatest event at, at in Israel's history, Gabriel shows up to say, the Messiah is arriving and your son is going to be his trumpet. He's going to prepare the way for the Messiah and he can't say a thing about it. He's got my, nine months to think about the obstruction of his praise, doesn't he? Remember the story I opened with? They actually relate. <laughs> yeah. There, were, there was an obstruction for him. Praise. What was his obstruction that kept him from praising God? Unbelief. Think about your obstruction for praise. What is it? What is your obstruction for praise? Well, you just don't know what's happened in my life. You don't know what happened to the last church. You don't know what these Christian people did to me. You don't, yeah, we've all got baggage. What's your obstruction? Because you need to get rid of the obstruction at the foot of the cross and out comes the praise. And, and in case you haven't realized it from studying uh, Zacharias yet, uh, this man is steeped in the Old Testament. He reads his Old Testament. In fact, all throughout his song here to God, he just quotes the Old Testament left and right. It just outcomes the praise when the obstruction of unbelief is gone. So I would submit to you at the beginning as we look at these verses, when you deal with whatever your obstruction is to praising God, the one who brought the Messiah, when you deal with that sin, whatever it is, before the cross, out comes the praise. And one of the great ways to allow the praise just to flow out, read your Bible. Because the more of the word that goes in, the more of the praise that goes out. So I would say if there's, there's not much of that water flowing out to your lake, well, you need to have more of the word of God flowing in. So with those things in mind, let's uh, review our main idea that we've been developing for three weeks. Main idea is he's a man, Zacharias is a man who moved from solitude to gratitude, big time. It just took him nine months. And as he moves from solitude to gratitude, the moment that uh, uh, he comes to faith and, and believing that his son in his old age is going to be the messianic forerunner, out comes, well, huge words of praise for this entire rest of this chapter. Now, we know, just by way of review, uh, that their family had a beautiful day. They were, the son came, just as prophesied. Uh, it's eight days later. They're going to circumcise the child. It's a joyous day. Friends and family are there. And that's when they have a huge family fight. Remember last week? A family feud. They fought. What was the, and this is how family fights start, over things that are like, what was that we were arguing about? Just at the lamest possible time, they have a fight. It's at a beautiful day, a circumcision of the boy, and, and they're fighting over, what are you going to call him? Remember last week, wherever you, what did the family want? Yeah, we, hey, we want him, uh, Jewish tradition is name him after the father. And all of a sudden, the aged mother pipes up and says, oh no, we're not going to call him after the father. God gave us the name, John, John. They didn't stop the argument. Remember last week? They continued to argue. Then they asked the dad, what, uh, Zacharias, we, we know you can't hear us. So let us write it on a tablet. What's the kid's name? He gets a tablet, writes on there. We saw last week. What? It's John. At that precise moment, what happened? His obstruction was gone. What was his obstruction? Unbelief. Now all of a sudden, the unbelief is gone, and now there's major belief there. And out of that 
pipe of his life comes flowing words of praise. He's going to praise God profusely about two things. Number one, in this order, he's going to praise uh, God for bringing the Messiah. And then he's going to praise God for bringing the messenger in that order. Verses 68 to 75 is praising God for bringing the Messiah. And as he praises his God for bringing the Messiah, uh, there's an order to his praise. That praise for the Messiah is going to first deal with God bringing redemption and God remembering to bring redemption. That God remembered to redeem us is a huge thing because, well, after 50, we tend to forget things, do we not? Don't you love cars with like the chirp so you can find it? Ever lost your car in a parking lot? Now when I go to high, you know, big parking lots, so I take pictures of where my car is. And I go back to the phone. Yesterday I was actually uh, going back through my phone erasing voice messages that you could put on there, you know. And I, I don't remember what they all are, so I, Liz was in visiting some people, so I sitting in the car waiting for us. So I hit, hit, I didn't know what this one voice message was. <laughs> I hit that little button and it came on and it says, your car is an A7. <laughs> you know, slot number 107. And I'm like, what was that from? But anyway. <laughs> I just submit that to say, our memories are not that fantastic. And my wife's always telling me, how can you remember Hebrew words and verbs and Greek stuff and this and that, and you can't find your car keys? <laughs> Is it not true? Absolutely. Yeah. So we'll get to the remembering thing in a moment, because it's really great that God remembers, isn't it? He does not forget anything. So let's look at first the praise we're dealing, not just with God remembering redemption and to bring it but the fact he brought redemption verse 69 his praise comes out like a mighty torrent he says uh, and he has raised up god has raised up a horn of salvation who did he raise it up for for us who's that that's israel he rose it up for us and where did this horn of salvation come from oh david his servant uh and why did it come about this way through david well just like he spoke through the holy prophets uh, the old prophets. What did he say? Well, in verse 71, he quotes from one of the old prophets. Remember the Old Testament? Great way to praise God is quoting scripture. He quotes from the Old Testament and says, salvation is from our enemies uh, and from the hand of all who hate us. Let's think about this first in the order in which it's given. He says, and he has raised up. Let's just stop right there. Past, present, or future tense of the verb. And the verb is the word raised. I know it's, what is it? Past tense. Don't you love grammar on Sunday mornings? Don't you love grammar on Sunday mornings? <laughs> yeah, I do. It's inspired. It's the word of God. So it matters whether he chose past, present, or future tense. Now, bear in mind that he used the past tense here of the verb raised. You have to ask yourself the question. Since Christ is the Messiah, and he hasn't been born and gone to the cross yet, why is he speaking in the past tense? Oh, yeah. I'm not asking for you to answer, but do you, do you know the answer? Because God always follows through on what he says. Yeah, God always follows through. And in his mind, it's as if God already followed through. So he went from unbelief, remember that was the obstruction, now he has total belief, so much so, it's as if the cross is a done deal. And he says in his praise to God as it flows out of his soul, oh yeah, God, you've raised up a horn of salvation. Now, don't let the word throw you, because the word horn can have many connotations, right? It could speak of a trumpet, it could speak of a shofar, etc. But he's not speaking of those. He's speaking of a horn of like an animal like a massive animal, a powerful horn, because it, the horn was, that was where the power came from. The, the brazen altar that they sacrificed on had four horns on it, literally. It was, it's, it's what they would uh, strap the animal to as they sacrificed. It was, it was the power of God to redeem through blood sacrifice. He says, God has raised up this Messiah who's the horn of salvation. It's powerful, powerful to save us will be the Messiah. Uh, Years ago, when my kids were uh, in their teens, we went to South Carolina on many trips, but one of them was to go see my dad's family in uh, Kershaw, South Carolina, and I'm basically related to the town, because literally, um, because they moved there in the late 1700s and never moved, except for my dad in the Korean War moved, uh, and then went to California, and then after the war, and then never came back, but uh, to move, to live there. But, so we've been back many times to see the family, and my, my grandma, Lily, was one of 17, children. Uh, my grandpa was one of 10. Uh, my dad had 10 sisters and huge family. They always told me, Marty, you need to marry a nice girl from the South. From here. <laughs> right. Uh, anyway, we won't go down that road. But <laughs> So one day we took the kids there. We, we want, and when you know everybody in a little Southern town, because you're all related, you want, you know, you want to go to a pond. So, you know, Uncle JQ's got a pond and whatever. You just talk and, you know, everybody's got, got a boat from 
cousin Timmy and blah, blah, blah. So we wanted to go take the kids to go uh, pick watermelon. Uh, and so my uncle Walter had a ranch, hundreds of acres, and a lot of it's uh, watermelon. So we took the kids out there. Uh, remember that, Liz? We went out there and then he, he wants to show us his big giant bull. He had a bull, uh, like a Brahma bull. I've never seen one in the flesh before. And uh, so we took him out of the truck. We all jumped in the back of the truck. We got the cameras ready. He parks us out in the middle of a field. We're looking the horizon, like, where is this thing? We're looking one direction. Bull came from the other direction. And you could hear it coming. It was like thunder coming at this truck. I'm thinking, he's going to flip this, this Chevy Silverado. Because you turn it, you whipped around and saw it coming at you. Heads down, horns are. And, and I got a picture of Amanda. Remember that? I got a picture of Amanda. It's one of the funnier family. You have funny family pictures, I'm sure. I got one of Amanda when the bull came up behind her. She's just, she's white as the lights on that tree. I mean, she's just, I'm dead. Because it's coming right at her. It's grunting, it's snorting, and those massive horns. No one's leaning outside the truck to go, let's pet the little bull. Because we all respected what? Power of the bull. The horns. See, that's why they used horn to denote salvation. It's power. Power what? You're born spiritually dead. How, what makes you spiritually alive? Salvation of the Messiah. No, you don't understand right now. I'm trying to work my way into God's presence by the good deeds that I do. And I'm so ceremonial, so ritualistic. Okay. Won't save you. Only the Messiah can save. He is the only one that is the horn of salvation. You know, you're born spiritually blind. What gives you new eyes? Well, only the Messiah and his power can give you new eyes. You know, Paul says in, in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anybody is in Christ, they're a new creation. Behold, the old things have gone away. Your old life is gone. Behold, new things have come. You're a new person, spiritually. You were once dead, now you're alive. How'd that happen? By the faith placed in the Messiah who saves. He's the horn of salvation. See, when he gets a chance to praise God, he says, oh yeah, I, I know who the Messiah is. He's the power of God who will save. And he happens to come exactly like God said he would come from the house of David. David, the great king, would come the great king of kings and Lord of lords, Jesus. Horn of salvation points to Jesus as that great one. He's raised up a horn of salvation from the house of David. Uh, you can go all throughout the Old Testament and find many places in, in the prophets uh, where it explains that the Messiah will come from the line of David. People of Israel, Abraham, tribe of Judah, line of David, the king, based on 2 Samuel chapter 7. There's one great uh, prophecy uh, given by Jeremiah the prophet, some 600 years before Christ was born, around 5 BC. Um, Jeremiah 23 talks about the great Davidic king that would come. Uh, and bear in mind, uh, this is many years after the death of uh, David the king, so pay attention to the terminology that comes from Jeremiah's prophecy. And, and bear in mind, the Babylonian invasion is looming on the horizon. Notice what God says. He says, what are the shepherds? the leaders, spiritual leaders, and could be the political leaders as well, who are destroying and scattering my sheep and uh, of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who are tending my sheep, you scattered my flock, and you've driven them away, and you not attended to them. How does God deal with shepherds who don't take care of the sheep? Oh, behold, I'm about to attend to your evil deeds, declares the Lord. See, I don't know about you, but I take my job seriously. And that's not sarcastic. That's the dead truth. Because God wants to know what the shepherd's doing. These shepherds were not tending the sheep. See, at this point in time, if you study Israel's history and you study the prophets, they were watering down the word of God. And they were saying, it's okay to be syncretistic and wed religions for the sake of love and peace. And my, my, so my daughter married a Canaanite boy. What a lovely family. So they, so they worship another God. It's okay. We don't want to offend them and we observe their, their worship of Chemosh and da, Dag, the god of the fish. and it's, it's okay with us. We still worship God. We allow all that other stuff. And the priests verified it and blah, blah, blah goes the culture. And God says, I'm going to judge the shepherds for allowing my sheep to be scattered on the hills and not to be uh, in the land as they're supposed to be. Verse 3 says, then I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries. That's important to note. All the countries where I have driven them and I'll bring them back to their pasture and they will be fruitful and they will multiply. You have to ask yourself, uh, when was Israel scattered? We'll just study history. Two major occasions. 722 BC, Teglath-Pileser destroyed the 10 tribes of the north, carried away them to captivity, dispersed them. 586 BC, uh, on the third deportation wave, the destruction of Jerusalem, Nebuchadnezzar wipes out the Jews and carries them into captivity. And there's no more Israel as it were, but God does not forget his word. 
And he says, I'm going to gather them out of all the countries. And they're going to be fruitful and multiply. He says, I'm going to also raise up shepherds over them, and they will tend to them, and they will not be afraid any longer, nor terrified, nor will any be missing. You have to ask yourself, is Israel today in a state of total peace, and are they not terrified of anything? Yeah, just come with me in April when we go over there to walk where Christ walk. It's an awesome trip. I think I have openings for five more people. There's room for you. Greatest trip you'll ever take. And when we go there, you're going to see just the greatness of the land of Israel, God's land, the apple of his eye. You'll, you'll see where he, the prophets prophesied and taught. But you'll understand that it is indeed a dangerous place. The trip is very safe. Israeli security is amazing. But, but when you're there in the land, uh, you realize it's a very hostile environment. Uh, my guide that I use is a great guy. He's a former uh, paratrooper uh, trained by our army rangers and airborne people years ago. And he became a master sergeant and Great guy, Asher Ashkenazi. Great guy, is he not? He's just, he's amazing. He's amazing. Uh, last time I was in Israel, a year and a half ago, we were sitting on the Arbel Cliffs overlooking the Sea of Galilee, some 1,100, 1,200 feet below us. Awesome place to be, day two. And you're seeing the whole Sea of Galilee, the city of Capernaum is right on the, the coastline, right below your feet. And our tour group is down on the edge of the cliff on a railing there, taking pictures. And Asher and I are up on the hill by ourselves, sitting on some rocks. The wind's blowing through, you know, what's left of our hair. And he looks at me, and he, we're looking at the Golan Heights. You can see towards Syria to the north. And he looks at me, and he says, you know, Marty, the Jewish people are, we're good people. We're not perfect, but we're good people. We just live in a really tough neighborhood. Go ahead. Absolutely, Asher. Tough neighborhood. But it's my opportunity to tell my friend, but one day, God's going to, he's going to fulfill his word to the prophets, to you as a people. And he shall. And we see that in verse 5. It says, behold, the days are coming. God says, when I will raise up for David, who's been long since dead, a righteous branch. Who's the branch? He says, uh, this branch, he will reign as king and act wisely and do justice and righteousness in the land, which has not happened yet. In his days, Judah will be saved. That hasn't happened yet. And Israel will dwell securely. That hasn't happened yet. And, and this is the name by which he will be called, in case you want to know his name. What's his name? Well, it's, his name's going to be the Lord, Yahweh, the eternal one, our righteousness. He'll be the epitome of holiness. That's the Messiah. It says, therefore, the day are, days are coming, declares the Lord, when they will no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought up the sons uh, of Israel back from the land of Egypt. But at that time, they'll say, as the Lord lives, who brought up and led back the descendants of the household of Israel from the north land, from all the countries where I'd driven them. Then they'll live on their own soil. The day's coming when they will come from all nations back here, and the Messiah will be their king. He'll be the king of kings. And he'll come through the line of David. See, when Zacharias is beginning to praise, he's, it's pouring forth from his mouth because he's saying the same God who said that the King of Kings, the Messiah, will come uh, has indeed fulfilled his word because he comes through the line of David, as prophesied, to be the King of Kings. When's the last time you praised God specifically for those Old Testament texts related to the Messianic King coming based on God's prophecies? Do you even know where they are? I give you some hints. 2 Samuel chapter 7, Psalm chapter 2, Psalm chapter 89 etc. and etc. I mean, God, I read these and I praise you. See, he's praising God based on the scriptures that he's reading. And he said, God, thank you for bringing the king exactly like you said you would bring right through the, the line of David. And the angel uh, is going to, Gabriel is going to make this uh, totally apparent to Mary. Remember Luke 1? The angel says to her, do not be afraid, Mary. Why? You found favor with God. And behold, you'll conceive in your womb and bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. And he'll be great, and he'll be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him what? The throne of his father, David. And he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. See, Jesus came to be that great Davidic king. We just know the story, that he was rejected and cut off, but he's still coming back to finish that kingdom, as we've seen as we studied the book of Matthew. See, what Zacharias is doing, he's saying, God, I've read my Old Testament. You have fulfilled it to the letter, and I praise you for that, for bringing that Messiah to be our Savior. And then he throws in, I praise you for remembering to do it. Verse 72. He says, uh, this is to show mercy, mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. Now, I want to stop there for a minute. The word remember in Hebrew, zakar, means to remember with action. I mean, in the West, we might say, oh, yeah, 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 I remember that. And then just move on. No, when you say zakar, when you say remember zakar in Hebrew... It is to remember with activity. See, when he says, God, you remembered the mercy to our fathers, 
into that covenant you cut with them, it means you remember it to the point of acting on it. He says, which one? Well, it's the oath that you swore to our father Abraham. How long ago was that from uh, Zacharias' perspective? At least 2,000 years. God has a memory. He remembered 2,000 years ago, I made a, a covenant, an unconditional covenant that I made with Abraham. And he said, I remember to fulfill that by bringing the Messiah through that, that line, through that people. All throughout this passage, he quotes the Old Testament. Here are the places that he quotes. Uh, when he says to show mercy to our fathers, he's quoting Psalm 25, verse 6, and Psalm 98, verse 3. When he says that you've remembered the Holy Covenant to Abraham, he's quoting from a variety of places, like Genesis 12, 2 and 3, Genesis 17, verse 7, Genesis 22, verse 15. He's quoting the Old Testament. When he gets down to the point saying, you, you've granted that we would be rescued from the hands of our enemies, he's quoting from passages like Exodus 19.6, Jeremiah 30, verses 9 to 10. He's taking what he's reading for those nine months, and he's saying, God, I, I praise you for being a God who after 400 years of silence between the Testaments, you've seen fit to take me and my wife in our old age. We are nobodies, and you've remembered to bring the Messiah through the line of David, through the tribe of Judah, from the covenant you cut with Abraham. You've remembered, and he's humbled. Again, I submit to you at Christmas, you can do no greater thing than to remind God that he's a God who remembers. And I'll tell you this, you're gonna really thank God that he's a God who remembers the day he calls you home. You hear me? The day he calls you home for him to say, oh, I know who you are. You're mine. See, he's the God who remembers. He praises God. This Christmas, let that just flow out of your heart. Remembering the Old Testament, things about the Messiah, and praising God for sending that Savior. The second thing he does is he praises God for not just sending the Messiah, but for sending the messenger. The messenger is going to be his son, John, John the Baptist. Verse 76, notice what he says. It says, a new child will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways and to give his people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. First he praises God for the Messiah, and then he turns to his little boy, who's eight days old, and notice the fatherly language that he uses. It's totally tender. He calls him a what? Child. You can just kind of see his hand on his son's head. You, John, you're going to be a special child. What's his obligation? He's going to be the prophet, not a prophet. He's going to be the prophet. Par excellence. Of who? Well, he tells you who. The most high. The highest name of God of all. This is amazing. This is going to be some kind of little boy. He's going to grow up to become the greatest prophet of all the prophets. And he'll be the prophet of the most high God. That's an interesting term that he uses for God. Because God has many names. He uses the name the most high God. What I find interesting is uh, when Satan defected in Isaiah 14 verse 14. He defects because he wants to be like the most high God. And he loses his position as the choice cherubim. See here we have... Uh, Zechariah acting in total humility, unlike Satan, saying, my son, in all of our obscurity, is going to be chosen to announce the coming of the Messiah who's going to destroy the devil in sin. It's amazing. And that whole most high God concept, if you uh, search that usage, it's used heavily in the book of Daniel. It's in chapter 3, verse 26. It's in chapter 4, verse 2, verse 17, verse 24, verse 25, verse 32, verse 34. Uh, chapter 5, verse 18, and verse 21. Chapter 7, verse 25. Why does that matter? He's quoting Daniel. What's Daniel about? The rise and fall of all earthly empires, and they consummate with the arrival of the Messiah, who destroys all other earthly systems and brings his great theocratic kingdom to earth at his arrival. And who delivered that message to Israel? It was an angel. What was his name? Gabriel. Gabriel. Who gave... Zacharias, the word that his son would be the Messianic forerunner? Gabriel, I don't know, it's just a side note, but who's probably listening to the praise of this old man besides God? Are you listening to me? G Gabriel. Don't you think Gabriel's listening? Gabriel's saying, I was the last major prophet voice about the coming king of kings. And, and, and I told Israel what was going to happen. 
The rise and fall of the Roman Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire. I, I prophesied. God gave all that word to you as a people. And now the Messianic forerunner is here, and he's praising God for all of that. And I'm sure old Gabriel is off to the side smiling, going, man, he totally got it. He totally got it. No more disbelief here. That obstruction is gone. Out comes praise. He praises the Most High God. And he, in that praise, he tells his little son what his job description is. Other than being a prophet of the Most High God, he says that you will go forth before the Lord to prepare his ways. You're going to make uh, the ground ready for the arrival of the Messiah through your preaching. And in verse 77, uh, he introduces us to an infinitive in Greek. And it's classified as a purpose, uh, an infinitive used in a purposeful way. His purpose, his job description is to give his people, Israel, the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of sins. What's John's marching orders? That's it. Did he fulfill his marching orders? Oh yeah, all the way to the end. See, when he started preaching, he started out in the wilderness preaching, down in the Jordan River area. I mean, you had to walk down from the high plains of, uh, the high uh, tabletops of Jerusalem and go down the mountains, down into the desert of the Dead Sea area to, to hear John preach. He didn't send him to the city. You had to go find him in the wilderness and people came in droves because he preached the truth of the word of God. You know, I put it to you this way. People show up for good restaurants, right? Did you hear me? You know, they, you pick restaurants by how many cars are around them. Isn't that what you do? That's what we, when we first moved here, that's what we did. You know, when we didn't know anybody, we didn't know food, we're like, okay, how many cars? It's packed, you go in, you know? I mean, he preached great food. They showed up in droves to hear John the Baptist preach. Notice what it says in Luke 3 about how he fulfilled his job description. It says in verse 4, it says, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, uh, the voice of the one crying in the wilderness, John, what's he crying? Oh, make ready. Make ready what? Oh, the way of the Lord. The Lord's coming. Make your path straight. Get your lives together. He's coming. Every ravine will be filled. Every mountain and hill will be brought low. The crooked will become straight. The rough road smooth. And all flesh will see the salvation of God. And so he, he John, began to saying to the crowds when he's preaching and he's baptizing them, notice the positive nature of his message as he preached out in the wilderness. Can you see it? What was his positive message? Is it up there? I think it's the next slide. Yeah. What's his positive message? Can, it's in English. Can you see it? What, 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 what's he say? What's his positive message? You brood of vipers. You know, people say, you know, I came to church, you know, just to kind of feel the warm fuzzies, you know, to kind of just feel emotional, you know, to have the pastor's words love on me and encourage me and all those things and blah, blah, blah. When you went to hear John, he's in your face. He called you a what? A brood of vipers? Another, our vernacular, we would say a what? A bunch of snakes? Huh? You know, I, I hiked down all the way from Jerusalem as a Pharisee to hear this guy, and I don't know who he is. He wasn't trained in our yeshivas. We don't know where he came from. Everybody's going to listen to him. They're not coming to my synagogue service anymore. I got to check him out. And I got down there with my other Pharisee friends, and right, he starts his sermon off with, you're a bunch of snakes. <laughs> I would call that in-your-face preaching. You know what's missing in America today? In-your-face preaching. That's a whole other sermon series. That's more than one Sunday. In-your-face preaching. You came down there as a Pharisee saying, I am saved uh, because of my righteous works and all of the things I do. I pray so many times a day. I'm careful to tithe so everyone can hear my money dropping in the box. I'm just a holy person. I pray in public on corners so they can see me. And John says, no, you're, not, you're a snake. You're a snake. See, he challenged your worldview. I mean, he was in your face. He made you uncomfortable. Again, we we're missing that kind of preaching that calls sin, sin, and that is just the way that it is. He took sin and said, that's sin, and if you don't repent, there's wrath. That was John. Notice what else he says in his positive message, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? I mean, how are you going to escape it? Therefore, he says to them in such a positive fashion, uh, therefore, bear fruits, because wrath's coming. Therefore, bear roots, fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say to yourselves, this lame argument, well, we have Abraham as our father. Uh, I'll put this into a we more Western vernacular. Uh, because I was born a Jew, I'm saved. 
What's he tell them? He's telling them at the Jordan River, if you think you're going to heaven because you're a Jew, you're not. That's what he's telling them. Your pedigree doesn't save you. What saves? Christ saves. You talk about preparing the way for the Messiah. He, he's, like, he's like the allied forces on D-Day. They're pounding the coastline. Why? They're preparing the ground for the troops. He's pounding the coastline for the arrival of the Messiah. Wow, for, for preaching like that. And he says to them, I love this. He says, for I say to you that from these stones, and there's a lot of stones down in the area where he was preaching. From these stones, God is able to raise up children of Abraham. Indeed, the ax is already laid at the root of the trees. The Pharisees are the trees. So every tree that does not bear forth good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Talk about a positive way to end a message. <laughs> he said, if you don't repent and come to God on his terms, he's cutting your tree down and you're gonna be thrown into the fire and it's not the kind of fire you're thinking about for a tree. It's hell itself. Powerful preaching. His dad told him as a little boy, son, you're gonna prepare the way for the Messiah and you're gonna preach like no one's preached. And you're gonna turn a nation toward the Messiah so that when he comes, they're gonna listen. Verse 78 is most interesting because it tells you about the heart of God. He says, because of the tender mercy of our God with which the sunrise from on high will visit us. You, John, he says, you're gonna be part of pointing to the sunshine, the light. Uh, this light will shine upon those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death uh, to guide our feet in the way of peace. He's, he's quoting from Malachi chapter four, verse two. And he's saying, John, as you preach, your preaching is going to point, as Malachi prophesied 400 years before you were born, you get the privilege to point to the Son of God who will shine his light of truth into many dark lives. I don't know how you feel about camping out. You love it? Do you? At nighttime, it's not cool. There's no electricity. You turn the lantern out and it's dark, isn't it? And especially if there's no moon, it's really dark. And the night's just kind of spooky out in the woods. I mean, just admit it. Well, at least I'll admit it. I mean, most of the guys here, I ain't admitting that. No, I'm not saying. It's scary out there. It's dark. And what's beautiful is the next morning at sunrise when the sun comes up. And you see that the sun just, pow, this is powerful. See, that, that's like salvation as prophesied. He's saying, son, you're going to get to introduce the sunshine of all spiritual truth, the Messiah. And this darkened nation that's totally lost and groping for truth, you're going to prepare the way for the Son of God to come and shine his light into their darkness, and they will find the way of peace. Was Jesus the light of truth? Absolutely. John 1 starts this way. In him, Jesus was life. Uh, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness does not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God, his name, John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. And he, John, was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light coming into the world. He's the one that enlightens every man. He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. Who is he? He's the Messiah. He's the son of God. He came to shine light into dark spiritual lives to give them light. And his dad says, son, you're gonna get the point. People, to the light of God. You don't know who's in your family as a child. Your next little child may be the one to point many people to the light of the Son of God. What a privilege. See, that's John's privilege. And his dad says, son, you're gonna be that guy. And he praises God for allowing his son to be that kind of prophetic voice. And he praises him based on text like from Malachi chapter four and says, God, I praise you from what I've read in the Old Testament. You've sent the Messiah, you've sent the messenger, my little boy. I praise you for that. What's the praise factor like in your life today? Is it like the, the tube that's, that's dry because there's an obstruction? Well, then if you're a believer today, it's time to get the obstruction out of the way to confess and come clean to say, Lord, forgive my dry heart and let praise come out of it this Christmas season for what you've done. And if you're not a believer, today's the day to bow before the Christ, the son of God. He'll, he'll flood your soul with light and life. I close with a story because I love stories. Uh, when I was uh, a fourth-year student at Dallas Seminary, Liz and I, she worked for a dentist, and her doctor invited us uh, to go to a picnic for his office and some other dental offices, and, and we went, and it was at a lake uh, out near Mesquite, Texas, um, and we had a lot of fun. And so there was going to be a sailboat there that day, a small one, like a two-man sailboat, 
And I, I used to sell in San Diego Bay when I was younger. I had a lot of fun Mission Bay selling. And, and so I was looking forward to it. I hadn't sailed in a long time. So we got there, had lunch, and it came time to go sailing. It was a really windy day. I'm thinking, it's perfect. And so got, uh, another guy that was with us said, hey, let's go. So I jumped in the boat with him. He said, do you know what you're doing? Uh, yeah, I've done it in years, but I think I, think I remember. And he goes, I'm going to take the rudder. You take the sail, and we'll go for it. So we took off and, you know, got the sail position just right. Have you, you sailed before? Yeah, it, it was awesome. Just We just took out across the lake. We we're bouncing over the white caps. We we're having a great time. We got way out in the middle of the lake. Then it was like, hey, let's turn around. Let's, let's go back toward land. Maybe somebody else wants to come out here. So we spun the little boat around, and we're just clipping along. He's got the rudder. I got the sail. And as we're clipping along, I hear this sound of metal breaking. Bink! Bad sound when you're sailing. And then all of a sudden, the boat just stopped. And he's like freaking out with the rudder. And it's, the rudder's like in his hand. <laughs> Bad sign. Bad sign. And I'm like, what happened? He goes, I, I, the rudder just broke. Well, it broke. That, like, that little pin that holds the rudder in place, it just snapped. We got any other ones? <laughs> no. Like, what are we going to do? We're stuck out. I, I, you know, we're, we could die out here. Remember, it's Texas. It's a big lake. Yeah. It's probably a pond. But anyway, so there we are in the middle of this lake. Wind's blowing, sails limp, you know, no rudder, can't go anywhere. We're going around with the current, and we're, it's all over for us. So we were sitting out there. We had to improvise with a lot of the stuff that was in the boat, trying to shove what's left of the pin back in there. And we finally did a makeshift little pin in there, like a cotter pin type thing, to put the the rudder on there and we kind of had to hold it in place and it, we just we barely got back but we got back but once we got the pin situated like we needed to we took off again now what's that got to do with what i've talked about oh everything how so in two ways number one if you're a believer in christ whatever was the event that's wiped out the praise in your life whatever it was and you know what it is spirit's telling you right now whatever that is that wiped out the praise in your life you confess that to christ right now because your boat's dead out on the lake because there's no praise. But the minute you put that praise pin back in there and say, Lord, forgive me, once you put that praise pin back in there, your boat's gonna take off and sail to new destinations. And it's gonna be a joyous Christmas. The other application of the metaphor is this. If you're not a believer in the Messiah Jesus, you never had a pin. Your boat's been floating aimlessly for years. The minute you come clean to say, Lord, I'm a sinner and you indeed are my savior. The day you do that, he puts the pin of salvation in your boat and it heads into some new areas you never thought you'd go to that are full of joy and peace. Let's pray. Father God, thank you just for old Zacharias and his wife, Elizabeth, and for what they teach us at Christmas regarding praise for the birth of the Messiah. There's much to learn from him and Lord, fill our hearts full of praise. Whatever our obstructions are, might we come clean? Might you fill us with the word of God so much so that it... Uh, bubbles forth from us in words of praise in light of what you revealed through the scriptures. And if any among us does not know you as Savior, uh, you have the power of the horn of salvation to save them. And might this be the day they claim you as Lord and Savior. And might their little boat take off in an amazing way. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.